calls us each by name. And let us worship God together. Please join me in the opening hymn, Standing as Your Eagle. Say welcome, pass the peace. so blessed to have another baptism today so at this point I'd like to invite Isla to come forward with her entourage she's taking a little walk right now which happens and if any of the kids would like to be able to come down to sit down here to see the baptism you're invited to no pressure of course but you can come right over here Members and friends in Christ, we gather now to celebrate the gift of grace in the sacrament of baptism. There is one body and one spirit. There is one hope in God's call to us. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and creator of us all. Jesus came to John to be baptized by him, but John tried to make him change his mind. I ought to be baptized by you, John said, yet you have come to me. Jesus said, let it be so for now, for in this way we shall do all that God requires. So John agreed. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. Then heaven was opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and lighting upon him. Then a voice said from heaven, this is my own dear son, my beloved, and with him I am well pleased. At another time, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The sacrament of baptism is an outward and visible sign of the inward and invisible grace of God, inasmuch as the promise of the gospel is not only to us but to our children. Baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is a mark of their acceptance into the care of Christ's church the sign and seal of their participation in God's forgiveness and the beginning of their growth into full Christian faith and discipleship. This is the water of baptism. Out of this water we rise with new life, forgiven of sin and one in Christ, members of Christ's body. So I have questions for you today. Do you desire to have your child baptized into the faith and family of Jesus Christ? If so, please say we do. Will you encourage this child to renounce the powers of evil and to receive the freedom of new life in Christ? If so, please say, we will with the help of God. Will you teach this child that she may be led to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? If so, please say, we will with the help of God. Do you promise, by the grace of God, to be Christ's disciples, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, and to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best as you are able. If so, please say, we do with the help of God. We do with the help of God. All right, last one. 
Do you promise, by the grace given to you, to grow with this child in the Christian faith and to help her be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ by celebrating Christ's presence, by furthering Christ's mission in all the world, and by offering the nurture of the Christian Church so that she may affirm her baptism? If so, please say, we do with the help of God. We do with the help of God. She's ready to answer on her own. <laughs> She's, she is prepared. I love it. These questions are for all of us as members of the body of Christ. So if you are willing, answer in, in what I tell you to do. Wow, that sounded really harsh. You will do what I tell you to do. No, I will give you the words. You don't have to make them up on your own. Do you believe in God? If so, please say, we believe in God. We believe in God. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? If so, please say, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? If so, please say, we believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit. If your heart is willing, please join me for a moment of prayer. We thank you, God, for the gift of celebration called forth by your saving word. Before the world had shape and form, your spirit moved over the waters. And out of the waters of the deep, you formed the firmament and brought forth the earth to sustain all life. In the time of Noah, you washed the earth with the waters of the flood, and your ark of salvation bore a new beginning. In the time of Moses, your people Israel passed through the Red Sea waters from slavery to freedom and crossed the flowing Jordan to enter the Promised Land. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus Christ, who was nurtured in the water of Mary's womb. Jesus was baptized by John in the water of the Jordan, became living water to a woman at the Samaritan well, washed the feet of the disciples, and sent them forth to baptize all nations by water and the Holy Spirit. Blessed by your Holy Spirit, gracious God, this water. And by your Holy Spirit, save those who confess the name of Jesus Christ, that sin may have no power over them. Create new life in the one to be baptized this day, that she may rise in Christ. Glory to you, eternal God, the one who was and is and shall always be, world without end. Amen. Now, by what name shall your child be called? Oh, she wants to walk. Check out this beautiful gown she's in. It is from, taken from her mother's wedding gown and was used to baptize her sister before her. So they're starting a beautiful family tradition. I was I baptize you in the name of God, your father. And God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, may you be blessed and know yourself to always be a beloved child of God. Everybody, this is Isla. She's a little starstruck. I know, I'm sorry. And we, if, as I said, if we didn't have COVID, what I would do is we would come right down to the middle and I'd have everybody stand up and be part of a big blob of blessing where we would all reach out a hand of blessing to Isla and her family. Instead, we're going to do that with a distance. So if your heart is willing, hold out your hand and join me in our congregational blessing. Yeah, she's got it. We as a congregation promise to care for Isla as our sister, as a member of our household of faith. Isla, we now pledge ourselves to you. As long as God calls us to walk together, we will live out our baptisms as a loving community in Christ. We will nurture you in faith, uphold you in prayer, encourage you in love, and never let you forget your beloved child of God. May you grow strong in the embrace of your family and your God. Amen. Last week I almost skipped it. This week I have it in the bulletin so I don't forget. Let's sing a chorus of Jesus Loves Me. Everybody 
let's welcome Isla. You may be seated. <laughs> Throughout the month of June, because the kids have been learning a special song about the Lord's Prayer in Vacation Bible School, we have been sure to push our prayer time forward so that we can do that with them before they head out to Sunday school. This is our last week for that. This will be the last time you'll hear this song, although I suspect it'll be running through your heads for months yet to come, as Vacation Bible School songs often do. So at the end of our time of prayer, rather than pray the Lord's Prayer, you'll be invited one more time to sing this song. And I also think that Miss Jean is going to come forward and do the motions for us one more time, so you can all get that as well. And the kids are invited to come too. I see you back there. You know how they go. So I'll invite you forward when it's time. It is our joy and our responsibility when we gather together to bring our concerns and our joys to the one who called us here today. And so we continue to pray right now for our country in the midst of all of the division that is in it. We continue to pray for Daryl Shrail as she continues to be in the hospital. We give thanks that Jackie Winfield is doing better in rehab and is getting her strength back and may be able to go home soon. And we continue to play, pray for the healing and health of Nicholas Mabs. If your heart is willing, please join me in prayer. God, for the sound of new life, we give thanks. We thank you for the opportunity we had again this week to celebrate the sacrament of baptism. We say that it's an outward and visible sign of the inward and invisible grace of God. And it reminds us that each one of us have been created in your own divine image. And we carry a spark of you around with us. And we thank you for that reminder. We thank you that we belong here and that you love us and call us to be part of family. Today, we think of all of the places around the country where they will be celebrating pride. We had our celebration a couple weeks ago, but we give thanks for the opportunity to celebrate the radical, wonderful, beautiful, riotous diversity in which you have created all of us. And wherever there are celebrations today, we ask that there will be great joy and safety for those who gather. We continue to pray today for our country. It is so broken. And as we find ways to heal the gaps and to build bridges, we also ask that you will hold, have us hold firm to our values of welcome, love, and inclusion. We think of Daryl today and we ask that you'll continue to be with her as she continues in the hospital. Give her strength, and be with her family too as they support her during this time. We continue to pray for Jackie. We give thanks that she is improving and that her strength is returning to her and that she might be able to return home soon. And we ask that you'll be with Nicholas. Give him strength and a sense of your presence and the healing that he needs. We know that there are so many prayers that we carry in our hearts right now that we haven't brought forward to you people that we love, things that we're concerned about, our worries, our fears, our deep joys. And so we turn them all over to you, knowing that there is no better place for them to be than in your hands. We ask now that you'll be with the rest of our time together. As we hear again a tremendously familiar story, help us to hear it with new ears so that we can hear in it our story as well in what it is to wrestle, in what it is to be blessed, in what it is to be named and identified as one of yours. We thank you for all of this, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Gene and team, come on down. You're able, and we'll sing our Lord's Prayer song one last time. Okay, you guys ready?
seated. I've been invited by Laura to come out each Tuesday night as the kids have been having vacation Bible school to kind of be with them for part of the evening. And I am just blown away by the tremendous amount of energy that goes into these VBS songs. It wears me out just to watch them. So it's been a really good time and I am, I'm so glad that we've been able to do that this month. The last thing we're going to do before we send the kids off to Sunday school is to bless our prayer shawls because they made some. Um, we have a whole vast array of prayer shawls up here today. They will be blessed and then given to members of our faith community, but also folks that you know who may be suffering from an illness, recovering from something, need a reminder that they are loved and cared for and prayed for. And so on your way out today, come take a peek at the beautiful work that our people have done. And if you know someone who could use a prayer shawl, let me know, and we'll make sure that one gets to them. So again, I invite you to hold out your hand of blessing, and together we'll bless our prayer shawls with the prayer that we have in our bulletin. May God's blessing be upon these shawls, warm, comforting, enfolding, and embracing. May these mantles be a safe haven, a sacred place of security and well-being, sustaining and embracing in good times as well as difficult ones. May the ones who receive these shawls be cradled in hope, kept in joy, graced with peace, and wrapped in love. Blessed be. Amen. Amen. At this time, our children are invited to head on out for Sunday school. It's also the moment in our service where we take the time to consider the ways in which we can give to the ministry that's happening here at the Congregational Church of Batavia. As you heard from Susan earlier, yes, it is partially about the money that we're able to give, but it's also about all of the gifts that we have. Our gifts of hospitality and joy and music and celebration and working with children, all of those things together make this church an amazing place. I also wanted to point out really quickly that if you have an offering, one of the places that you can put it is in the little wooden church that's sitting right out there on the table. That said, we give thanks for Julie and Lily and the gift of music this morning. Beautiful. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Genesis, chapter 32, verses 24 to 33, 4. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. 
When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming, and four hundred men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on ahead of them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable for you alone, O Lord, are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. What I know about wrestling would fit comfortably in a thimble. This minuscule amount of knowledge comes from two distinct and not equally reliable sources. The first, one boots Sobieski. A friend I met the summer of my freshman year while I was working in the kitchen at Circle C Christian Dude Ranch. Boots, called such because of his penchant for wearing big black rubber work boots wherever he went, lived in Erie, Pennsylvania, and we soon became dedicated pen pals. I would write him, and I would tell him about school, band, my church youth group, the the high school musical, and he, an ardent devotee of the World Wrestling Federation, would in turn regale me with the latest exploits of Hulk Hogan, Randy Macho Man Savage, and Jake the Snake Roberts. Because of this, although I personally didn't regularly watch professional wrestling, there was a period of time in the late 80s when I knew more about Andre the Giant than I did about beginning algebra. Actually, that still might be true. (laughs) The other source of whatever wrestling knowledge I may lay claim to comes from the year that my son Liam decided he wanted to take up the sport in school. He was in seventh grade, stood slightly over four feet tall, and weighed 60 pounds soaking wet. I was utterly terrified for him. But it's what he wanted to do, so Michelle and I bought him the special wrestling shoes in red and the headgear that would protect his ears and the mouth guard for his teeth, and we sat in the bleachers holding our breath every time he had a match, which blessedly was not as often as the other wrestlers on his team. Because he was so small, there wasn't always someone in his weight class on the opposing side. On those days, we prayed a little prayer of thanksgiving and relief, And on the occasions there was an opponent in his weight class, we would just sort of grit our teeth as we watched the two of them thrash it out on the mat. Because despite all of the safety gear and the copious and clear rules and the practiced eye of the referee who was overseeing the proceedings, wrestling is still a violent sport. And it stressed out my tender mother's heart to watch my son vie with another boy for the literal upper hand, knowing that at any moment, either one of them could be hurt. I did not like it. And I was deeply relieved when Liam decided that the sport just wasn't for him. That's it. 
It's all I know about wrestling. A little bit about the theatrics and big personalities of professional wrestling, learned secondhand from a rabid teenage fan some 30 years ago, and a smattering about the legitimate sport gleaned from watching through my fingers <laughs> for the one season my son wrestled in middle school. And neither one of those shallow pools of knowledge could have prepared me whatsoever for the scene that we come upon in our scripture lesson today. Jacob, wrestling with the unknown figure throughout the night, has nothing in common with professional wrestling. It is not meticulously planned and carefully choreographed for the entertainment of a roaring crowd, nor does it really have anything to do with competitive wrestling as we know it today, laden as it is with rules and regulations and strict oversight designed to keep participants as, faith, as safe as possible. No, what we find here in chapter 32 of the book of Genesis is nothing, nothing less than a bare-knuckle brawl where life and limb themselves are on the line. But what has brought us here? What has brought Jacob here to this existential struggle on the banks of the Jabbok River? Because when we met Jacob last week, he was on a very different journey having conned his older brother Esau out of his birthright and openly stolen their father Isaac's blessing from him, Jacob had fled his brother's rage and the only home he ever knew for the relative safety of his uncle Laban's in Haran. And it was there on the way that he stopped for the night and dreamed of a ladder reaching from heaven to earth with angels ascending and descending upon it. It was there that in spite of everything that he had done, Jacob received God's blessing. It was there that he discovered that no matter where the road took him, God would always be there to travel it with him. Years and a variable lifetime of experiences passed. Jacob indeed found his uncle Laban and made a home there with him. He married twice, in fact, sisters Leah and Rachel, another strange story for another time entirely. And he began to have the numerous offspring that God had promised him, 12 sons who would become the 12 tribes of Israel. And he became exceedingly wealthy. Life was on the surface good, blessed to use the word that we used last week. But Jacob wasn't content, he wasn't happy. He wanted to go home. So that's what he did. He packed up his wives and his kids and his herds and his household, and he started back to the land of Canaan, the land that had been promised to him and his father and his grandfather before him. And as he journeys, he gets word that his estranged brother Esau is coming out to meet him with 400 armed men. And it's on the eve of this reunion or confrontation, we don't know which yet, with Esau that today's story picks up. Jacob has sent his family and herds and household on ahead across the Jabbok River, but he himself stays behind for some unknown reason. And a mysterious man steps out of the darkness and attacks him without a word. It's a strange and alien story, reminiscent of pagan folk tales that predate the time of Abraham himself. It defies easy interpretation. It is God in human form who emerged from the darkness to wrestle with Jacob through the night. And love. This particular vision of the story opens up a way for all of us who have ever found ourselves struggling with our faith, grappling in with who we believe God to be and who God really is. All our questions, all our doubt, all our fear, all our hope find expression in this contest. And like Jacob and later the Thomas the Apostle, we discover that God is big enough and strong enough and secure enough to hold together, to literally embrace all of these things that we bring with us. In other words, it's not only okay to wrestle with the divine, but it is also a pathway to enlightenment, to wisdom, to maturity, to blessing itself. Another interpretation that comes from some of the scholars of the Hebrew Bible that I read in preparation for today is that the unnamed wrestler who steps out of the darkness to do battle with Jacob is actually none other than his big brother Esau, who he doesn't immediately recognize after a decade and a half away. Esau, who Jacob so horribly wronged and who threatened Jacob with death the last time he saw him. 
We know from our reading this morning that the story of Jacob and Esau has a happy ending, that it culminates with embraces and tears and reconciliation in the morning sun. But in this version, before they get there, the brothers must literally struggle with each other and their estrangement in the darkness. Repentance and forgiveness do not come easily to either one, but only through blood, sweat, and tears. How many of us can relate to that? How many of us have broken and difficult relationships with family members, with friends, with significant others that seem to defy all attempts to heal them? How many of us fear the hard emotional work that is required to do? This story, the story of Jacob and Esau wrestling through the night, reminds us that even though it may take some painful work, such reconciliation is possible that love and grace can win through over bitterness and strife in the end. The final interpretation of the identity of the pugilistic stranger that I want to talk about this morning is that he is a manifestation of Jacob himself. That in the dark night of the soul, Jacob wrestles with his own demons. Pride, selfish ambition, greed, lust, all the less than perfect traits that have plagued him his whole life here have taken on physical form and stand in the way of the blessing Jacob has been seeking and striving after since the days of his youth. Before he can grasp that blessing, he must master, or at least come to terms with, these character flaws. And who can't relate to that? Who among us hasn't weathered a sleepless night as we counted the ways in which we fall short of who we want to be, of who we know we were created to be? This is a story that we know all too well, but it too has a happy ending. An ending where Jacob comes out of the struggle with a new name, a new identity, and a new way of being in the world. He discovers, as do we in this story, that with God, transformation is possible. Jacob wrestles with God, Jacob wrestles with Esau, Jacob wrestles with himself. However we read and interpret this ancient tale, through whatever lens we choose to look at it, through whichever door we enter in, this is our story too. It's about the struggles, the roadblocks, even as I said earlier in the sermon, the bare knuckle brawls that we encounter as a part of our spiritual lives. And what we learn from this story, our story, is that the blessing only comes with the wrestling. We can't skip ahead to the good part. Life doesn't usually work that way. We may be tempted to try and avoid the pain and the struggle and the pure exhaustion of it all, but if we do, these things will only emerge from the darkness to attack us somewhere further down the road. We must face the things that haunt us, and when we do, we must hold on for dear life. Hold on until we get the blessing. Because the blessing is there. Because the wrestler is not our enemy, but rather, as Buechner said, a loving adversary, bent on healing us, strengthening us, making us whole, putting us on the path that will lead to joy, to hope, to peace, and to love. We just have to be sure that we face the real doubt, the real fear, the real brokenness, the real sin, the real grief that are there in the night. And we must hold on tightly until we receive our blessing in the morning. It will take time, and sometimes it will take Herculean effort, but it will come. Like Jacob, we will be blessed. Like Jacob, we will be transformed. And like Jacob, we won't come away unscathed. We, too, will carry the marks of battle, the scars of having striven with God and with humans and having prevailed. But they're beautiful scars, like the holes in the risen Christ's hands inside, a sure sign of resurrection. Because in the morning there is joy, in the morning there is hope, in the morning there is love, in the morning there is blessing, in the morning there is new life. So let us give thanks to the God who wrestles with us. Amen. If your heart is willing, please join me in the unison prayer that's printed in the bulletin. Ever-present spirit, the story of Jacob shows us your willingness to enter into the messiness of our human struggles, into fractured relationships, 
family differences, unreconciled situations with people we care about. Yet all too often we shut you out, holding on to our hurts and grudges because we do not want to loosen our grip on our perceived control. Help us to wrestle with the conflicting values, desires, and pressures that confront us daily so that we can unclench our hands and open ourselves to the transforming power of your holy presence. We know that only then can we fully embrace our own pain and the pain of others, and by doing so be fully open to the embrace by your love in return. Amen. Our closing hymn is appropriately Change My Heart, and I invite you to stand again as you are able. As we continue our road trip summer series, take this blessing with you as you go. As you go forth today, may you go with great confidence for the God of the universe goes before you, leading you along your path. That same God walks behind you, guarding you on your journey. God walks beside you, your constant companion in life. God is the solid ground beneath your feet and the glory of the skies, but most importantly, in the person and work of Jesus Christ, God goes within you, so go forth today and shine. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the prelude. Amen.